About a year ago, I'm staying out of trouble. My phone rings. I see the Folsom Police Department. His name come up, and I think I better answer this. Pick it up, and it says, you have been given as a reference for George Hill. My name is Tony somebody, I said. I'm sorry. I know no one by the name of George Hill, and hung up. So the following Wednesday, I come to church. I'm standing out front greeting, and I happen to notice the name tag that says George Hill standing beside me. So I said, George, are you involved with the police in any way? And he said, yes, I'm trying to get a job there. So I said, well, let me tell you that I hung up on a police officer who was trying to get a reference. So would you give him my name and number back and I'll give you a good reference. So when I heard that George was talking today, we were standing out there talking and I feel like I owed him one. So George, um, you're a great inspiration to us and we love hearing your word and I'm glad you got the job at the police department. After an introduction like that, I don't know what to say. But since how school has just started, I thought I would give you an exam. And uh, think about the question, and then I'll give you the answer that a student gave. In which battle did Napoleon die? The student said, his last battle. <laughs> then the next question was, where was the Declaration of Independence signed? His answer was, the bottom of the page. <laughs> the River Ravi flows in which state? His answer was, liquid. Then the next one, what is the main reason for divorce? He's a very thoughtful student. He said, marriage. <laughs> and what is the main reason for failure? Exams. What can you never eat for breakfast? Lunch or dinner? And what looks like half an apple? The other half. And if you throw a red stone into the blue sea, what will it become? Wet. How can a man go eight days without sleeping? No problem at all. He sleeps during the day. He sleeps at night. Uh, how can you lift an elephant with one hand? You'll never find an elephant that has one hand. <laughs> if you had three apples and four oranges in one hand and four apples and three oranges in the other hand, what would you have? The student said, very large hands. <laughs> if it took eight men 10 hours to build a wall, how long would it take four men to build it? No time at all. The wall's already built. <laughs> and how can you drop a raw egg onto a concrete floor without cracking it? Any way you want. Concrete floors are very hard to crack. The teacher didn't give him a good grade, gave him a zero. <laughs> and as I was thinking about today, and actually, it's more about what the Lord has talked to me about than what I'm going to talk to you about, but I've written it down and to let you share, and that is, where are you on the path to fulfill the vision God gave you? Now, when you first came to know the Lord, he may have given you a vision of how he wanted you to serve. 
You may have thought of something. It may have been a little while later. It may have been any time along your walk with the Lord. And I don't know the vision that God has given you or how you would like to serve him. At this time in our lives, we can look back and see times when we obeyed him. We can see times when we didn't obey him. We can see times when we failed him. But just because we failed doesn't mean God's through with us. He still has a plan for us. And as I look back, I can see how God manipulated my circumstances in such a way to get me where he needed me at the time he needed me there. I was, in 1983, I was working for Pacific Motor Trucking, which is a subsidiary that was wholly owned by Santa Fe Railroad. Santa Fe Railroad at that time wanted to merge with the Santa Fe, Southern Pacific wanted to merge with Santa Fe. And uh, Santa Fe told Southern Pacific, uh, you have to get rid of your trucking. So I was out of a job. And living in South Sacramento at the time, I applied for jobs around town, went through the employment department, and I couldn't find anything. And my, at that time, my youngest daughter was going to Calvary Bible College in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, she had a car back there. She was having some problems with it, so at the end of the school year, in 84, I went back to pick her up, and uh, I put in some job applications while I was there. I figured, might as well. And uh, I got hired by the Internal Revenue Service. And uh, they wanted me to start in September. And at the end of August, my mother died from cancer. And uh, so that basically cut any main reason I would need to stay in South Sacramento. And my wife did not go with me at the time I first went back, give me time to get settled back there, but also she was teaching kindergarten at Sacramento Christian Schools, which was a school that our church was operating. But she had some medical problems and our oldest daughter had just graduated and was going into teaching, and so she was working with her mother, and uh, she called me and said, uh, Dad, I'm putting Mom on the next plane. She's having some real problems. Uh, I want you to have her. I don't want her here. So she came back, and uh, her diabetes was out of control, causing problems related to that. And then I went to work for IRS in September, and then in November, on Veterans Day, we had the day off, so I went around looking for some work uh, where I could get a little bit better pay than what I was getting at IRS, and I found a job with uh, Cross Tire Service, because when I was working at PMT, that was one of the things I did, was repair truck tires. And uh, so I put an application in, and then they called me the Monday before Thanksgiving and wanted to know if I'd come to work the next day. And I said, no, it's going to take me more than a week to finish up the paperwork to get out of IRS. Because you leave a government job like that, all kinds of paperwork to take care of. And so as a result of our being back in Missouri, I think it was 98, I don't remember the exact year, but... Uh, my wife's uh, sister, the oldest of her sisters, her son was in the Air Force. And he ended up being court-martialed and being sent to Fort Leavenworth Military Disciplinary Barracks. So us living in the Kansas City area, we were close enough we could visit every week. His parents only came a couple of times during the time he was there. But as we were there, we would go into a room waiting to be ushered into the visitation. And so we got to know a lot of the wives and mothers of other prisoners. And so as a result, 
Uh, my wife started talking to some of the wives and seeing how she could help them. And then later on, one of the mothers uh, had moved to uh, New Orleans. And she was down in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina hit. And she had uh, some friends down there, a family. It was a mother with her two sons. Uh, the mother was in her 70s, and the boys were in their uh, late 50s, early 60s. And uh, she called us and said, uh, do you have room for three people? Well, the house we had at the time, we didn't know why we had that big of a house. That we had three bedrooms upstairs, the master bedroom and two others, and one of which we had turned into an office. And then downstairs, we had two more bedrooms and a half bath and a large family room. And I said, sure, no problem. The family arrived late Saturday afternoon. And we had no idea of anything about the family that was coming with her. And it was a black family. And come Sunday morning, we left for church as usual. And when we got home, the mother said, I can't believe it. A white family left a black family they don't know in their house with nobody to protect it. She was from the South and had been trained under the old rules in the South where the black people had no contact really with the white except the white people telling them what to do and when to do it. And we uh, got to talking to later on we uh, took uh, that family to go pick up some medication. And while we were there, a bus arrived from New Orleans that had people from there. And as the one man walked out, somebody walked out, turned around, came back, said, are you from New Orleans? He said, yeah. And he said, why? He said, well, have you ever gone to such and such restaurant? He said, yeah. He said, well, I was a maitre d' there and I thought I recognized you. It was another black man, and he had stayed at his house till the water got too deep. He went to his sister's house, it got too deep. He went to another relative's house, the water got too deep, and he finally was walking out into an area of New Orleans that was uphill, and it was the white people's section of town. And the people were there and said, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You gotta get out of here. And he, he got out of the water, he got up onto an overpass, and uh, then the people came and said, uh, you know, you can't stay here, we got a better place for you. They put him on a bus, took him down to a muddy field, gave him a bottle of water and said, here you are. And that's how they were treated in New Orleans at that time. But as I think of what, what took place. Well, uh, the nephew was there, my wife wrote to him, some of the other men saw him reading and one wrote, well, will she write to me? And said, well, I don't know, we can ask her. So he asked and uh, she said, sure, I'll write to him, but you have to be able to send me your name, your, your number, your registration number and the wing that you are in. And uh, so they went to the chaplain to find out if they could do it. And the chaplain took their name and he sent it to us. And so my wife started writing a, basically a prayer letter to the men. And we ended up with over 90 men and women there in Fort Leavenworth. They had both men and women there at that time when we started. By the time we ended, they had uh, built a new facility to house the prisoners at Fort Leavenworth and they had transferred all the prisoners out except for uh, about 500 that they kept there. And uh, so as a result, we, knowing that they were transferring people out, in the newsletter my wife told them, uh, Make sure you take our name, address with you, with your Bible that you'll be able to take with you. Then you send us the new contact information. 
one of the women went to Tallahassee Federal Prison for Women, and uh, she got the, gave us the information. We wrote her a letter. She was walking around the track reading the letter. The other woman said, you got a letter. Who'd you get it from? Uh, do you think they would write to me? And as a result, uh, we started writing to a lot of people because the woman here said, okay, my husband's over in this one or my son is in this one. Will you write to them? Will you include them? Now, my wife included in the letter just basic things that are happening today. What the grandkids did, uh, what the dog did, uh, and then also included an outline from the pastor's Sunday service. And they used that then for Bible study. That we ended up with over 250 people on our mailing list. And that was after we were told that we could no longer have contact with anyone at Fort Leavenworth, which was in keeping with their rules to begin with. Their rules at Fort Leavenworth, military prison, totally different than civilian. If you are related to or a friend of any current prisoner or former prisoner, you cannot have any contact with a current prisoner. So God opened a door, left it open, and then he closed it. But as he closed it, he opened up a lot of other doors. And uh, we were writing to men in over six states, in I think it was over 10 prisons. But uh, we also wrote to their wives and their, uh, their family. Uh, Chuck Colson's prison ministry does not allow the people participating in it to have any contact with the family. They can only have contact with a prisoner. <clears throat> and as I think of that, all of this, I think of scriptural uh, examples. And the first one I think of is Abraham. Now, God, when God called Abraham, and it was Abram at the time, in Genesis 12, 2, he gave him a three-pronged promise, plus a responsibility that was connected to those promises. He said, I'll make you of thee a great nation, promise one. I will bless thee, promise two. And make thy name great, promise three. And then the responsibility, and thou shalt be a blessing. <clears throat> we see through scripture the fulfillment of the first three. God did make of him a great nation. God did bless him, and he made his name great. But we see also where Abraham failed at times his responsibility of being a blessing to other people and blessing them where they are. As God asks us to bless people, he doesn't say we have to take them out of where they are. He doesn't tell us we have to bless only certain people, but to bless each one. Now, that promise is given five times in the book of Genesis with the responsibility. Three times to Abram, then to his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. Now, if you talk to a Jewish rabbi about the Pentateuch and you ask him, uh, what about what God says in the Pentateuch? They said, oh, we, we pay attention. And if he says it twice, oh, that's great. You know, we really pay attention. If he says it three times, that, that's the top. Well. Then ask him, well, what if he says it five times? Their first immediate response, he doesn't say anything five times. And a, a friend of mine who had been a missionary, he t had a rabbi friend, and he talked to him about this. And he went back, to, the rabbi went back to check it and said, I didn't realize God said anything that often in the Pentateuch. And the idea of blessing the war to the world did not stop in the Old Testament. In Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, 
being made a curse for us, for it is written, Blessed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And from this verse, we see that we, as children of God, are supposed to be blessing to other people. When people see us, do they see someone who is a blessing to them? Or somebody who is argumentative, somebody who is cantankerous? Uh, what do they see? And Abram, because of famine, he went to Egypt, and since he was there, he should have been a blessing. He was such a blessing, the Pharaoh told him, get out of here, go thy way. We don't want you here in Egypt. You create too many problems. He was not the blessing God had intended. Moses had a few problems too, you know? He is part of the Abrahamic covenant, being a child, a descendant of Abraham, that part of being a blessing continued on down to him. And we find what a blessing he was in Egypt, you know, at the age of 40. He killed an Egyptian that was fighting with a Hebrew. He was wanting to set the Hebrews free from that bondage. And so he had to spend the next 40 years unlearning everything he had been taught about being a leader and learn how to deal with stubborn sheep. You know, then after he learned how to deal with stubborn sheep, then God was able to use him. Are you dealing with stubborn sheep? Those who don't want to hear the word of God? Those who don't want to listen to you? And are you being a blessing to them even though they don't want to hear you? And then further down the line, we come to Daniel. Daniel, however, was a good example of being a blessing to others. He didn't seek everything for himself. He was happy to share what God had given him in his wisdom, what God had allowed him to go through. And he was able then to be of service to the kings, to each one of them, and also be an example to the other uh, Hebrew uh, prisoners that were there with him. And then we come to someone like Jonah. Now Jonah, you know, he didn't want to do things his own way. He just didn't want to do God's work at all. He wanted to run away from him. And he was more interested in not doing God's work. And have you ever wondered when you hear of a major catastrophe, uh, train wreck, uh, big pile up on the freeway, airplane crash. Have you ever wondered, is somebody involved in that that was running away from God like Jonah? God had to put Jonah in a place where he would listen to him. Now, God never asks us to go anywhere or do anything against our will but he will make us willing to go. He put Jonah in the belly of that fish to make him willing to go. He didn't say, Jonah, you gotta get out and go. No, he said, Jonah, you can just stay there in that fish. Think about what I've asked you to do. What kind of fish is he having to put us into to get us to stop and listen and think about it? And I don't know if you've ever heard this song before or not, and I'm not a singer, I'm not going to sing it, I'm only going to read the words. Lo, the conflict of the ages is upon us today, 
and the armies are assembling all in battle array. Are you numbered with the faithful, one of God's loyal few? Who have won him full allegiance? Can he count upon you? Have your eyes caught the vision? Have your hearts felt the thrill? To the call of the master, do you answer, I will. For the conflict of the ages, told by prophets and by sages, in its fury is upon us, is upon us today. Catch the vision of a lost world going downward in sin. Well, the master's great commission long unheeded has been. See the children of the kingdom joined in hand and in heart, pressing forward in the struggle to redeem this fair land. See the church of God awakening, and with glorious zest, she is lying, laying at her altars, now her noblest and blessed. Toward the final consummation we are hastening on, and the time for loyal service will forever be done. Have your eyes caught the vision? Have your hearts felt the thrill to the call of the master? Do you answer, I will? For the conflict of the ages told by prophets and by sages in its fury is upon us, is upon us today. And in the videos that we have been watching of Dr. Jeremiah talking about the days of the last time, he has brought out the conflict of the ages that's taking place today. Satan doing his best to keep us from doing what God wants us to do. In 2 Timothy 2.15, we're instructed to study to show thyself approved to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But what are we to study? He goes on in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, tells us what and why. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so that we all are on the same page, let me give you a few definitions. Doctrine is what to believe. Reproof is what is wrong. Correction, how do we correct what is wrong? Instruction in righteousness, how to live. Perfect, having everything needed to do what God wants. Thoroughly furnished is completely furnished. As we study scripture, God gives us all we need for life and ministry. You have a ministry. You might say, no, I don't. You do. Someone has said, and I don't remember who's, who said it, but I've remembered it, and that is not everyone is called to full-time Christian ministry, meaning a pastor, a missionary, or something like that. But we as God's children are all called to full-time Christian living. So in our Christian living, we have a ministry. We have ministry to our children, to our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, our relatives, our friends. And in Romans, we're told that God's free gift and his calling are irrevocable. When he gave you a vision, he gave you a calling. He hasn't taken it back. Now, he may have changed some of the direction. I remember, uh, uh, I think I might have been a senior in high school. I thought I would like to be a missionary. I thought I'd like to be a missionary in uh, Brazil. But that was an impossibility because of the fact that as a child, I'd had epilepsy, and so I was, would not be able to go and do that. But God gave me other ministries through the years, teaching Sunday school, uh, serving on the deacon board at church, doing some pulpit supply. But God opens doors. I was surprised a few years ago, I saw someone that I had not seen in years. 
and he thanked me for teaching him Sunday school when he was in the fourth grade. He is now a grandfather, and his son is now a pastor. It, you don't know the influence that you have on someone. You don't know where, where it will go. And you are not beyond giving, making a difference now. And as we think of the ministry, we think that that is sowing the seed. Now, if the seed is to be sown properly, and we see it in different areas of the country at different times, the first thing that has to be done is the soil has to be prepared. Are you someone who goes out and prepares the soil? And then once the soil is prepared, somebody else comes along and plants the seed. Are you the one that plants the seed? Then it has to be watered. Are you the one who waters it? By just a word or two, or whatever. Are you the one who gets the joy of reaping the harvest? Not everyone gets to reap the harvest, but the one who prepared the soil is just as much in that reward as the one who reaped it. We're all part of God's plan. And as a friend of mine that was the director, or he, he was, did interviewing of missionary candidates for the mission board he worked for. One of the first questions he'd ask any candidate is what are you doing in your church today? And if they'd say, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not interest, I'm not doing anything right now, his response is, you go home, get active in your church, then come back and see me. What are you doing in your church today? I may never see tomorrow. There's no written guarantee. And things that happened yesterday belong to history. I cannot predict the future. I cannot change the past. I have just the present moment I must treat as my last. I must use the moment wisely, for it soon will pass away and be lost to me forever as part of yesterday. I must exercise compassion, help the fallen to their feet, be a friend to the friendless, make an empty life complete. The unkind things I do today may never be undone. Any friendship that I fail to win may never more be won. I may not have another chance on bended knees to pray and thank God with humble heart for giving me the day. He gives us each one day at a time. And I remember a plaque years ago. It said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now, there are, you, you are called to be able to do three things as a child of God. Preach, which is sharing the gospel. Pray, and prepare, be ready to die all on a moment's notice. Because you never know when the moment will be right for you to say the right word to somebody that will bring them to the Lord. We sometimes think, you know, I, I, I don't have anything. I, I can't do anything. I ran across something that I thought was very interesting. And that is, I'd like to read it to you. A little girl stood near a small church from which she had been turned away because it was too crowded. I can't go to Sunday school, she sobbed to the pastor as he walked by. Seeing her shabby, unkept appearance, the pastor guessed the reason and taking her by the hand, took her inside and found a place for her in the Sunday school class. The child was so happy that they found room for her and she went to bed that night thinking of the children who have no place to worship Jesus. Now, this took place in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Some two years later, the child lay dead in one of the poor tenement buildings 
Her parents called for the kind-hearted pastor who had befriended their daughter to handle the final arrangements. As her poor little body was being moved, a worn and crumpled red purse was found which seemed to have been rummaged from some trash heap. Inside was found 57 cents and a note scribbled in childish handwriting which read, this is to help build the little church bigger so more, more children can go to Sunday school. For two years she had saved for this offering of love. When the pastor tearfully read that note, he knew instantly what he would do. Carrying this note in the cracked red pocketbook to the pulpit, he told the story of her unselfish love and devotion. He challenged his deacons to get busy and raise enough money for the larger building, but the story does not end there. A newspaper learned of the story and published it. It was read by a wealthy realtor who offered them a parcel of land worth many thousands. When told that the church could not pay so much, he offered to sell it to the little church for 57 cents. Church members made large donations. Checks came from far and wide. Within five years, the little girl's gift had increased to $250,000, a huge sum for that time near the turn of the last century. Her unselfish love had paid large dividends. When you are in the city of Philadelphia, look up Temple Baptist Church with a seating capacity of 3,300, and be sure to visit Temple University where thousands of students are educated. Have a look too at the Good Samaritan Hospital and at the Sunday School building, which houses hundreds of beautiful children, built so that no child in the area will ever need to be left outside during Sunday School time. In one of the rooms in these, this building may be seen the picture of the sweet face of the little girl whose 57 cents so sacrificially saved made such remarkable history. Alongside is a portrait of her kind pastor, Dr. Russell H. Conwell, author of the book, Acres of Diamonds. And this is a true story which goes to show what God can do with 57 cents. Then I think of the sign that was crossed the uh, back of the uh, pulpit at the auditorium. And it said, is there a soul who died, who died because of me, forever shut away from heaven and from thee, because I tightly clutched my little earthly store, nor sent thy messenger to some distant shore? We don't know what God has in plan. And this, this is for me. You know, I'm, I'm only sharing with you what God has been working with me on. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just trying to share that I'm trying to be open with God. And I heard a song today on the radio, which I thought was very good. And I don't know all the words, but the title of it was, I Missed You Today. Speaking of God, talking to the one that wrote the song. He had not been spending his time with God the way he should, and so he wrote the song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are ever faithful. You're ever with us. you guide and direct us. Thank you now for this time together in your son's name. Amen. Amen.